I was crushed when I found out not all of them sang or did their instruments. It was only Shirley Jones and David singing. She was doing the doo ops in the background. That was a crushing blow when I found that out. Um, and then as an adult, you're watching them and they really could, could have done a better job like pretending to play the instruments. There was Tracy with her triangle and uh, you know, Danny could have moved his fingers a little more, but you know, I, I was eight or nine or 10. I didn't know any better back then. The responses that you got, you said in your piece about this kinship, which we all have with one another, a bond that's really hard to explain. It is, it's, it's we all shared something similar that we had his the the records and we watched partridge family and we waited to watch partridge family and they always had the two the one song or sometimes two songs in the episodes and that we all people remembered you know perhaps seeing him in vegas or perhaps going to a concert of his and they talked about the various um, ways in which he touched their lives and the posters on the walls and and just just so many fond memories. Um, it was it was a different era. We didn't have so much going on like the kids today. And those Friday night nights meant everything. So it's wonderful to share this bond with other people in my age group who remember. Yeah. D- did you keep your memorabilia? I still have, um, I think a couple, I definitely have a couple albums um, in the basement. I think I have Sound Magazine, where it says um, all his favorite things. He liked B.B. King, The Thrill is Gone, and The Color of His Eyes, and his birth date, April 12th. And um, so I, I have that. Do I don't have any posters. Those are long gone, unfortunately. But but the the vinyl still remains in the basement. And uh, when he died, I took it, took it out. My kids heard me playing or, or listening to it on Spotify and they indulged me. Um, I'm not a big crier. I'm not terribly emotional, but I definitely shed a few tears um, when he, when he passed away. And I didn't even really know he was sick later. I, I looked him up and saw the problems he was having near the end with um, things he couldn't get a handle on. And I guess people who were close to him probably saw him devolving in that way. But I think the general public maybe didn't have a sense of, um, you know, it wasn't a long battle with cancer. It was a long battle with something else, but it wasn't, um, we weren't as aware of what was going on with him. So it was a bit of a shock when my cousin told me, I was like, what? How important was David and his music to you as a teenager? I think by my teenage years, um, so I was born in 63. So oh, okay. the Partridge family was like 1970, 71. 70. So I was eight, nine, 10, 11. I think by my teenage years, the David craze had been a little bit over, but um, he was the first person I remember having a crush on, a real crush and you know, my heart fluttering. And when I still hear his music today, um, I, I feel a little bit that way. Um, I love the song he sang, um, Summer Days, when he's singing it to Tracy um, and, and she's smiling and, and all of us were like, oh my God, we wish we were Tracy. Um, but, um, which is so sad that, uh, you know, she's gone as well. But um, yeah, it was important. I, I think, uh, you know, our first crushes, our first loves like that are, are, are always very important and they stay with us. Um, they'll always be uh, teenage, t- tween crushes, but David was definitely, as I said, lightning in a bottle. And, uh, but as you said earlier on, you saw a different side of him when you, when you saw him as a stage actor. Yes, he was extremely talented and and much more so much more rounded than Keith Partridge. He his range of um, emotion and acting and and the songs that he did, both he and his brother. I th- it was a tremendous cast and they were just phenomenal. And as I said, it got both um, critical and public reviews were, were praise were, were 
terrific. It was not just because David was in it. It, he, it was a great show and he was great in it. In it. And uh, I came away even more impressed. And then I saw him years later, just in concert locally here in Westchester, New York, um, where he sang his songs, just not a show, a concert. And it was probably 15 years after that or a dozen years after that. And, um, you know, he was definitely in a different place, I think. And but he was happy to be there and he seemed to enjoy singing and the women seemed to enjoy listening to him. But it was a definitely a different a different venue and a different time and a different um, thing that he was doing. But I was glad to hear him sing those songs in person as well. You fell in love, obviously, with David. Um, there was the Partridge Family music. But did that music as it has done for many people, open up a whole new genre of music interest for you? I think it did. I think he was the first, my first 45 um, that I, I got, uh, and I listened to it over and over and over, and uh, one of my first albums. But yeah, it, he definitely, I would say, introduced me to music. So he was the first, of course, Billy Joel. I'm a huge Billy Joel fan very talented. I've seen him many times in concert here in New York and in the Boston area. And um, he's fabulous. He's extremely talented. And so, yeah, there have been, um, my musical journey has continued. And through my kiss, the kids, I, I said, I'm now a fish fan because of my oldest son. Um, they're a jam band and um, they're very good. So um, I, I feel like I'm still growing and evolving since, since that, uh, that time. Did you have any particular favorite tracks or albums from either the Partridge Family days or from David's solo work? Well, of course, Cherish from his solo, because who didn't? But from, from the Partridge Family, my number one song has always been Summer Days. I just love that song. But after that, it's a tie. I would say um, 24 Hours a Day, that was a good one. And I'm on my way back home another good one. Um, I'll meet you halfway. And then there's one, I think it's called Together We're Better. Yeah. Um, one step short of our heaven, but we won't stop short till we get that. I can't sing, but that's, uh, that was. You can sing. You can sing better than me. I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> we could sing together. We could do a duet. <laughs> you could do the duo. So that was a favorite. There were so many good ones. Um, Albert point me in their direction of Albuquerque um just a lot of great songs it, all of us we stop we pause we smile you know people write oh I love Dave Bobby Sherman and Sean Cassidy and um Davy Jones all good but not as good as David I'm sorry he wins hands down case closed so tell me about your life as a writer I've always been writing. I think I started journaling when I was seven, eight, nine, and was on the high school newspaper and the college newspaper, and then took a brief 30 year hiatus to raise my three sons who are 20, 25, and 30. And um, I, uh, back when they were little, I didn't really have the time. My husband works a tremendous amount. I didn't have a laptop for a lot of years, it wasn't like today when you can jot out a few notes. But once they were mostly grown, I started a blog on Facebook. It's called Thoughts from Aisle Four, um, growing daily, um, which is phenomenal. And I have wonderful, supportive readers, um, not just in my demographic. They're young, they're older, they're music fans. Um, so it's a very lovely group. So my readers on aisle four are, I mean, we have, I said that we have younger people and we have men, but most people are probably in our age group, our demographic. And it's such a lovely, supportive, like I could post it's raining. I mean, of course, David Cassidy gets an exceptional response, but they're just a very engaged, funny, nice group of people that have come on board and people meet each other. They're like, oh my God, my cousin's on, on your page and they no. chat among themselves. And it just, it's a, it's become, I don't, when I started, I, and you don't know where something's always going, you just do it. Wow. Um, and, but I'm much better in the written word, although 
I'm friendly and I'm good one on one. I'm not really an in front of the camera type of person. I don't really do lives. And last year I wrote my first book. I actually have it here. My son and his uh, wife were got married in July 2020. They were supposed to have a big 220 person wedding in Washington, D.C. Of course, that got canceled when COVID hit. So it ended up being 14 people in my backyard um, because it was the height of COVID. And I had all the kids living here. I had gone from empty nester to extremely full houser. um, And it was crazy, like trying to reimagine the wedding. Should it happen? Should it not happen? How should it happen? Will it be safe to happen? So um, I wrote a very humorous book, actually. It's called gains a daughter but nearly lost my mind how i planned a backyard wedding during a pandemic see that's me um almost losing my mind and my daughter-in-law who works for facebook she's an artist she she did the cover for it so that was a project that was a lot of fun and um i'm in the process of writing another book a compilation of various stories and actually the david cassidy pieces will be in that book as well because honestly it's one of my favorite pieces when you came to write your first book, it wasn't something you started out with the intention of writing. Was it just something that evolved? Well, as as things were happening, I was blogging about it on my page, on my Facebook page. And, you know, the wedding is supposed to happen. The wedding's not supposed to happen. Um, it's going to happen. How is it going to happen? Um, you know, we're, we're having it in the backyard and her parents, where will they stay? They rented an RV and parked it in our garage because they didn't want to go to a hotel and I, they didn't want to come into the house really because, and there was no room in the house because every room was full. So I wrote about that. So I was chronicling it in real time as it was happening. Um, the, the happy couple decided not to see each other before the wedding. So my son was in the basement. She was upstairs and they're texting each other. I'm coming up. My house isn't that big. I'm not in a mansion. I'm, I'm hiding in my son's room right now. Um, one of my son's room and they're yelling I'm coming up and it was like such insanity and people love the stories because we were all locked down and it was a bit of humor that people could relate to so I wrote all these stories and they got married and they moved out and everyone left the house finally and I said I have all these great stories maybe I'll put them into a book and I rushed to publish it because I thought well the pandemic's going to end in 10 minutes and it won't be timely anymore. Who knew two years later, we're still, you know, dealing with the situation, but um, it was so much fun to do. And because their wedding was not what they imagined, I feel like um, they have something special. They have a book about it. The book got a lot of press. It was featured in the Times of Israel and on a website called Smashing the Glass about weddings and So the book, this little tiny book was like the book, little engine that could and appeared a lot of places. And I think they're really happy because it made their wedding special in a a different way, um, a little bit more unique. And not everyone has a book written about their wedding. Didn't you take that opportunity to engage with local businesses and help them during the pandemic? I did. Did you read the book? Well, it feels like, you know, it's so... The the wedding became a very local affair where it was originally supposed to be in Washington, D.C. at a hotel because it was in the backyard. Local bakery did the cake with their theme was fish. They're very into the band fish. That's a whole other the way I love David Cassidy. They love the band fish, which is who I got to meet also unexpectedly, not knowing who they are sitting next to me on the beach all afternoon chatting with them, not knowing who they are. And this is my son's idol. And I found out at the end of the day that it was this band Fish who they follow. So their theme was fish. So they had a fish cake and then the local seafood place in town pre-plated everything. So hermetically sealed it and delivered it. Um, so nobody had to touch anything. I mean, you forget in the beginning of that we didn't know how it was spread. We had hand sanitizer with their name, masks with their logo on it, but it was beautiful. A local florist um, did the flowers. It was very in our backyard, beautiful rose cut glasses and farmhouse tables for the 14 of us. And we're Jewish, so they had a chuppah, which is like a canopy over under which you get married and it was a do-it-yourself with um 
my dad's prayer shawl was the top of the everything was homemade and local and my son got his suit at a local his suit at a local um a store in town. So everything became local and all the merchants became a part of this. And it was just such a wonderful, the fire, we, they had a drive-by um, where friends and the local fire department drove through and they sat in their chairs and their wedding garb and they, they waved to everyone. And it was such a special day after everything, the tears and the uncertainty. And there was no, we were checking the weather apps um so nervously um but the what this weather turned out beautifully and it was just the most spectacular and special event that one could imagine and uh, my son's best friend flew in overnight from the west coast um to be there and you know he stood apart with a mask everybody was very socially distant but it was it was really very very wonderful so even in this pandemic we've found rays of sunshine and new ways to do things and positivity i love that because you're being so creative but you're also helping your local community to thrive in an extremely difficult time for them that they must have adored you well they they enjoyed it too i think when the cake was delivered they came back to see the the flowers and how it was set up and it, it became just like um everybody was rooting for this to happen um that they wanted and when they had a fish cover band, a live band um, on my deck, and all the neighbors were dancing in the streets and listening to the music, and the two little girls next door sat on their deck watching the ceremony. My daughter-in-law looked like a princess in her white gown, and it was just really very, very special. So yeah, there this pandemic has been awful, no doubt about it, but there are some bright spots and I, I got a book out of it and um, it, it motivated me to go in a different direction and which is, you know, really nice because how many times can you clean out your sock and underwear drawer? drawer? Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know. You said a few minutes ago that you've got your book there. I wondered if you could find an extract that you could read. Sure. That's so nice. Um, should I tell the story? of oh my goodness there were so many funny stories maybe this the one I said um about them not wanting to see each other that week they're very it's a very quick book my next book is going to be much meatier but this is just I'll tell this one because it's short it's called hide and seek is this chapter my son decided he would observe the Jewish tradition in which the bride and groom don't see each other in the days leading up to the wedding it was a fine idea, except for the fact that they were both living here in this house, which is regular size. I mean, it's a lot bigger than the two bedroom, one bathroom house I grew up in in Brooklyn, but it's not palatial by any stretch of the imagination. There were six of us living here in this regular size house, which means it was never surprising to see another family member in the kitchen or on the stairs. No one said fancy meeting you here when they bumped into someone else. In fact, if you wanted to be alone, you needed to lock yourself in your bedroom or take a walk. Not that I ever felt the need to be alone. I roll. So you can see how trying to stay completely away from one person might have been problematic. My son moved into the basement while his bride had the run of the rest of the house. When he wanted to come upstairs, he texted or called her to let her know that he was changing his location. I saw them dashing about the house, watching two fully grown adults play hide and seek was somewhat amusing, if not a little strange. After being together for seven years, I guess it was kind of sweet that they wanted to do this. While working in my bedroom, bedroom, I heard my oldest son yell, coming up as my youngest son announced that his almost sister was in the upstairs bathroom. Yep, it was just another day in the life of a family quarantine together before a wedding. The whole book is is on that theme of different uh, of getting ready and and different um, different themes along that line the the trials and tribulations. It's funny. I said I always said I have three boys, and although I planned their bar mitzvahs when they were thirteen, uh, yay! I'll never have to do a wedding because it's not my jam, and I don't want to plan a wedding. And here I was doing the wedding. And of course, you've set the standard now because. Are your, are your other boys still bachelors? 
So middle son got engaged this past summer. We flew out to Michigan for the proposal, which was so beautiful and so romantic. And, you know, and youngest son, he's only 20, but he has a lovely girlfriend who we met at college as well. She's from Oregon. Middle son and his bride, they've set the the bar. They, they want a smaller wedding. They said it was so lovely and not necessarily a backyard wedding, but they, they, want something on the smaller side now because the, it was so much fun and it was so happy that they see you don't necessarily have to have 220 people to have have a perfect perfect experience where did you get the title of um, thoughts from aisle four where does that originate from that is the best question ever so my voicemail years before i was blogging used to say so i have three sons And they ate and ate and ate and ate and their friends ate and ate and ate. There was never enough food. I used to go like five days a week to the grocery store. And if I was going away, I had to tell them because they would worry about me. I I know everyone in the grocery store. They're my friends. Um, So when I started writing originally, my WordPress site just said Marlene KF. And my oldest son, um, said that's like the worst so my voicemail said on my phone um i'm telling this story convoluted um you probably can't if you can't reach me i'm probably in aisle four at the grocery i'll get back to you when i'm done and more often than not honestly that's probably where i was so when i started writing my wordpress site just had my name on it my son said that's an awful name why don't you just call it thoughts from aisle four because you, your voicemail says you're always in aisle four, which I was. So then when I started my blog, I called it also thoughts from aisle four, like my WordPress site. And um, so actually my oldest son, that was his contribution to the family business, um, as we call it. And uh, the name, you know, stuck and I love it. So, and the people in aisle four, my tribe are the best people. They're just a very love, lovely, supportive, funny they make me laugh all the time. We talk about lots of things, middle aging and parenting and this pandemic. And we laugh a lot and uh, it's it's been fun. I, I put up something almost every day. I was going to ask you if you think you've struck a nerve with an awful lot of women of our generation. Because Definitely. Could you talk about there being an empty nest. You talk about yourself being a food shopper extraordinaire. Yes. Oh, that's me. I, I'm the best. That is, I can, I'm also good at stain removal, but besides stain removal um, and laundry, food shopping is my jam. But we also cover other topics that are a little more serious menopause, aging parents, um, menopause. I had some emotional difficulties with that a few years ago. So we cover a lot of topics in aisle four from what to make for dinner to how rotten our children are and um, how little boys communicate. Um, But it's all in good fun. And um, I learn from them. I I put out topics and uh, it's, you know, sometimes politics that can get a little testy. You did say in one of your blogs uh, that your job as a parent will never be done. Ever, ever, ever. Who knew? I brought them home and I thought, okay, 18 years. So my oldest is 30. And um, no, never. You worry about them. You think about them. They still come to you um, despite having significant others. And I guess that's the way it is. But when you first start off having children, I don't think you quite get the scope of of what it's going to be. I was really moved by a post that you put up on the Holocaust Remembrance Day. Oh, you really do read me. Wow. Well, you shared the heartbreaking experiences of your grandparents accompanied by that beautiful photograph of of them. I didn't know if you wanted to talk about that because you said, I'm here because of good. I wonder how their experiences impacted on the type of person you you are today. Um, So my grandparents were from Budapest, Hungary. And that's where my dad grew up. And in 1944, my grandparents were taken away to Auschwitz, which was a a death camp. And um, my dad 
went to stay in a Jewish ghetto. I think there were like 70,000 people in the ghetto with, he stayed with a cousin and an aunt and she, um, you know, took care